so while waiting, I'd just like to remind all participants to mute your microphone and switch off your camera at all times. Please also keep your mobile phones silent. You may only turn on the microphone and camera once requested during the Q&A session. Thank you. We will start in any minute from now. Okay, so salam sejahtera and a very good evening to everyone. Welcome to the oral presentation for Room 4 Forensic Science. My name is Niva and I'm your MC in charge for this room today. So firstly, I'd like to introduce to all the presenters, our judges for today. We have Dr. Chang Kahao from University Science Malaysia and Dr. Li Lung Chuen from University Kebangsaan Malaysia. Okay, so before we start our session, I would like to remind all of the presenters regarding the instructions for your oral presentations. So number one, again, please mute your microphone and turn off your camera. You can only switch them on during your Q&A session. The slides will be handled by the person in charge of this room. Once the video slide has ended, please turn on your microphone and camera for the Q&A session. Once your Q&A session has ended, please turn off your microphone and camera. Please also take note that your presentation is only for 10 minutes, followed by a Q&A session for another 5 minutes. Alright, so I think uh, without delaying, we'll begin now. So, um, as for the first presenter, I would like to call on presenter code F03, Ms. Kasrin Saitahas, to present her research title Fabrication of a disposable electrochemical paper-based analytical device for size line detection in forensic application. Your video will be played now. My name is Kasrin Sai Sahat from Forensic Science Program, University of Science Malaysia. The topic of the presentation is Fabrication of a disposable electrochemical paper-based analytical device for silicine detection in forensic application. Silacin is a non narcotic drug marketed only for veterinary sensitive and analgesic purpose in animal. The clinical study presents the effect of this drug as an exorbitant depressant on the central nervous system and respiratory depression of the human, a condition including bradycardia, hypertension, and transient hyperglycemia in terms of this negative health implication. 
the Food and Drug Administration or FDA does not approve psilocin for human. This drug is often co-administered with an illicit drug like cocaine, heroin, and ketamine to increase the effectiveness of the drug. The misuse of psilocin has seen one drug abuser, suicide, accidental exposure, crime, and combination with other drugs with hazardous potential of combining misuse drugs to either increase or decrease the drug effect as well as raise the drug price when sold on the street. Many case reports on psilocin misuse, such as case of deaths in Puerto Rico where you psilocin as a drug adulterant or recreational drug, case of deaths in some area of the United States from psilocin overdoses, and case of psilocin misuse for crime in Thailand. The conventional method for the determination of psilocin, such as high-performance liquid chromatography, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. But this method, I use long-term analysis, had a sample preparation process, expensive instrument, needs skill and proficiency analysis, and unsuitable for on-site analysis. The electrochemical method is the most effective for detection because these methods are rapid and simple, inexpensive, selective and sensitive, and exclude a sample preparation step. Currently, only a few results on electrochemical sensor for xylacine detection were reported based on the conventional three electrode system. However, it is not suitable for on-site analysis. A screen print electrode which consists of working electrode, reference electrode and auxiliary electrode in one piece is a particularly appealing option for a portable electrochemical sensor. However, the screen print electrode is expensive, so the development of cost effective and portable electrochemical device to be a convenient and practical use is interesting. The objective in this work is to improve and develop a cost-effective and portable electrochemical sensor to detect psilocin based on electrochemical paper-based analytical device or EPAD. Electrochemical paper-based analytical device or EPAD carry great potential for on-site analysis and cost-effective. The device utilizes paper as a substrate for analytical measurement processing advantages such as low cost, lightweight, flexible, highly portable, and suitable for large scale production. An electrochemical paper based analytical device was fabricated by a simple procedure using an inexpensive calf cutter and low track transfer tape to create the three electrode templates made for the screen print process. Graphene ink with a high surface area was coat on the paper by screen print technique and further improved with polyaniline. Polyaniline was selected to improve the performance of electrode because it is the most promising conducting polymer-based electrode material. This polymer also has high electrical conductivity and the absorption of xylacine on polyaniline mainly occur on amino group of the chemical structure by hydrogen bonding and on the benzene ring by pi pi striking. Evaluation of xylacine was studied by adsorptive stripping wound tamity technique. This technique is widely utilized to enhance and improve the sensitivity and sensing range of electrochemical method. It consists of two main steps. First, the accumulation or deposition step before the absorption of the target analyte on the working electrode surface. In the second, stripping step or measurement step. In this step, the deposit analyte was stripped from the working electrode surface into solution, which is performed by utilizing one telemetry. The electrochemical behavior of xylacine was evaluated at the screen pin electrode where EPAD and polyaniline modified on EPAD. The word thermogram in the figure 1a is a cyclic one thermogram was applied using potential from 0 0.2 to 0 0.9 volt. A significant increase in the peak current xylacine was correlated with the surface area and conductivity of the electrode. The polyaniline modified EPAD 
produce a greater anodic peak current than the bare e pad and screen print electrode, showing that modified with polyaniline complement the electrode function through water oxidation of xylazine. After that, study the effect of amount of polyaniline for electrode modification from 0 to 2 microliters. The current signal increases with polyaniline loading from 0 to 1 microliters and decreases at higher loading. Higher loading results in lower current generation probably because the increased net of modified electrode inhibit electron transfer. Therefore, the optimum volume of polyaniline was determined at 1 microliters. Analytical performance of polyaniline modified EPAD for xylacine detection were investigated using a soft stepping voltammetry based on the optimized condition. This figure showed two linear range of xylacine detection with detection limit of 0.06 microgram per milliliter. The reproducibility of the EPAD was assessed through the evaluation of 10 electrode preparation. When comparing the peak current from 10 repetitions provide a good reproducibility with percent RSD less than 5% in acceptable range according to the AOAC guideline. And the effect of interference on xylacine dissemination with developed electrochemical sensors were evaluated by measuring various interfering compounds. This might be present in the Beverage sample. The result in the figure B indicate the good anti-interference property of the proposed device. The practicability of the developed sensor was demonstrated by measuring the level of xylacine in beverage sample supplied with standard xylacine. This sensor displayed good recovery in the range from 84 to 100 percent. Finally, this research can be concluded that the developed sensor is easy to use, provide a low detection limit, high sensitivity, and suitable for on-site analysis in forensic application. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Nasreen. Um, Let's proceed with your Q&A session. And for that, you may now turn on your microphone and also your camera. And uh, now we'll pass it over to the judges. So judges can ask your questions now for five minutes. But the want to start first. <laughs> um, I'm searching for my background. What's happened now? Where is my background? Uh, it's okay now. For my... <laughs> so. Please, you ask first, uh, because Catherine is my student, so I know a lot of things. Uh. <laughs> yeah, no, I just ask a few questions. Uh. Yeah. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, just now you present the example of cases, uh, but I noticed you did not give even an example from Malaysia. Do you mind to give an example of case from Malaysia? During your presentation, you provide some example, right? Yes. Sir. Yeah, yeah. But then, if I know Mr. Kenner, there's no example from Malaysia. Do you mind to give me one example of case in Malaysia, which involved the uh, I don't know, Zin, huh? Yeah. Um. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear. Yes. Wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Um. For. In, in Malaysia, uh, didn't file case about xylacine, but the xylacine is uh, like a ketamine scenario. And I, 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 I think if, if we can uh, detect the xylacine or in, in, if we can detect xylacine, this, this method is a model of a uh, Forensic uh, forensic identification for another duck. Okay, then uh, the second question is, 
uh, just now you compare, uh, you say the conventional method you rely on the chromatical fit technique, right? HPLC and GCMS. And I'm just wondering the technique that you propose based on the electrochemical method, right? So the electrochemical method actually is targeting on which compound or which properties of the cyanocin uh, for the detection purpose. Please, please, again, please. <laughs> <laughs> you see a different instrumental technique it will targeting on a different properties of the compounds, right? To do the detection. Yeah. So i just wondering the electrochemical technique, the, the, the device uh, you propose, uh, it is actually targeting on which properties or which uh, uh, characteristic uh, of the cytosine for the detection purpose. For the detection purpose. For, for the electro the electrochemical technique, each 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 analyte occur at the difference potential. Potential, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So, so okay. that that we set set the potential for silicine from zero point two to zero point nine. The silicine occur at at the potential range. Another 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 or another interference occur at at, at another potential difference okay thank you huh? and then uh one more <laughs> uh just now you uh you present a, a graph uh, of a curve uh, that's the in the reproducibility study uh? do you mind to explain how you perform the reproducibility study uh? <clears throat> when i fabricate the 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 e -pad, i for for one for one one piece of paper we can we can get uh thirty uh eighty eight eight eighty pieces and and when we can reproducibility I use ten electrode for for prepare the I can say to prepare the current of the silicine if ten electrode not not a like not different or or in the acceptable in percent is the less than five percent is this acceptable can you define for me uh, what did you mean by reproducibility what did you mean what what did you mean with reproducibility on this reproducibility that mean i use 10 10 one but uh 10 electrode get the same result or not because is this reproducibility i i do reproducibility to confirm the the electrode to in to confirm my electrode that i i create every time it is this it is equal current uh, sorry okay. to uh, yeah this actually <laughs> For question and answer. Uh, her five minutes time is actually up for question. Oh, up. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, no question for me. No problem. Oh. <laughs> I will ask you after this. <laughs> okay, thank you, doctor. We shall proceed uh, with the second uh, participant. Okay, second participant would be presenter F05, Miss Wan Nurul Shafawani, Binti Wan Muhammad Taufik, to present her research titled Preliminary Study of Determining the Ethnicity of Individuals Using Handwritten Bindles and Geometric Metrics. Your video will be played now. Good day, everyone. My name is Wan Nurul Shafawani, Binti Wan Muhammad Taufik. I am a forensic science student from forensic science program, School of Health Sciences, University Science Malaysia. Today, I will present about the preliminary study on determining the ethnicity of individuals using handwritten numerous and geometric morphometric technique. Fingerprint and DNA evidence has long been used in forensic investigation for individual identification. However, 
Other forensic evidence that also can be used for individual identification for the court of law is numeral handwriting. Numeral handwriting is a writing system that uses a single or a combination of numeral digits to express the number of given range by using the writing materials. It is believed that handwriting of individuals are influenced by many factors, including their ethnicity as different ethnic could write the numeral characters differently. The study involving the author identification by alphabet and signature are extremely prevalent. However, identifying the origin of writer by utilizing handwritten numeral is rarely done. This is due to the fact that the study related to the handwritten numeral is quite restricted as the data involving numerals is relatively small compared to other handwriting analysis. And some people are aware of how important numerals could be used to identify individuals. Even though handwritten numeral recognition has recently received a lot of interest between researchers due to its application in our daily life, such as automatic sorting of poster mailing, zip code, automated processing of bank check, and identification of numeric data. This preliminary study was aimed to explore the potential of geometric morphometry to analyze and determine the ethnicity of individuals from their handwritten numerous character. As far as this study is concerned, discrimination using numerous character was limited globally, including in Malaysia setting. Even though Malaysia is a multiracial country that made up 90% of Malay, Chinese, and Indian population, probably by introducing geometric morphometry approach into this field, Forensic document examiner may be able to determine the ethnicity of writer using handwritten numeral digits that can be found as evident in document fraud investigation. 20 handwritten numeral samples were collected from 10 Malays and 10 Chinese. These participants were asked to write numeral character of 0 until 9 on a four white paper for seven times within seven separate rows. There were some inclusion criteria. The participants must be able to write and read in their own native language. They must be able to assign themselves to any one of the two ethnic affiliations under study. And they must be at least of three generations of pure Malay or Chinese. The exclusion criteria were participants who are unable to write or read in either Malay or Chinese, or unable to assign themselves to any one of the two ethnic affiliations under study, or probably less than three generations of pure Malay or Chinese will be excluded in this study. These are the examples of numeral character that are obtained from the Malay and Chinese participants. All the acquired samples were then converted into digital image by using a scanner prior to image processing by following the scheme that shown on the screen right now. There were four important stages in this study. The first stage was pre-processing stage. This stage was performed by using filter that available in the Adobe Photoshop to enhance their contrast, brightness, smooth, remove noise, and extra feature from the digital image of Harriton's numeral sample. The second stage was digitizing and landmarking. The digital image were then inserted into TPSRT for digitizing purpose and then inserted into the TPSD2 software for landmark positioning prior to simple component analysis and Procrustes ANOVA in the morphogene. Principal component analysis was the third stage in this study, where principal component analysis was performed following the suggestion by Dalton et al. 2017 by using the covariance metric of procrustal coordinate in order to identify and then explore the morphological shape pattern that can be used to discriminate between Malay 
and Chinese handwritten numerals. And the last stage is proscriptor ANOVA. Proscriptor ANOVA was utilized in order to determine whether they are statistically significant difference of handwritten numeral character between Malay and Chinese writer. The p-value that looked into the account was p less than 0.001, where we will accept the alternative hypothesis and reject the null hypothesis. Principal component analysis called plots were generated in the Morpho-J software. And by looking to the result of this study, only numeral 3, 5, 8 and 9 were displayed two distinct clustering as shown in the figure 1 through 3 and 4. From the result, we can observe that the yellow cluster was belong to the Chinese writer, meanwhile the blue cluster was belong to the Malay writers. From the Procrustus ANOVA outcome that shown in the table 1, it is specifically showing there were highly significant difference between Malay and Chinese Harnitin numerals for numerals 3, 5, 8 and 9 since that the p-value of important was less than 0.001. The handwritten numerals which collected from the Malay and Chinese individuals did show some degree of similarity and dissimilarity of characters. In this case, Numeral 3, 5, 8 and 9 shown distinct clustering between these two ethnic. However, for other numeral character which not display any distinct clustering, probably there could be some sample from these two ethnic has appeared similar in characteristic. For example, numeral 0 and 1. Besides, it might be due to inadequate numbers of landmark or probably incorrect positioning of landmark on the Diditas Hamilton numerals or simply because the Hamilton numeral sample were indeed appear similar. The outcome from the Procrustus ANOVA show that there were statistically significant difference between Hamilton numerals of 3, 5, 8 and 9 between the Malay and Chinese individual who took part in this preliminary study. However, numeral character 0, 1, 2, 4 and 6 were insignificant between Malay and Chinese individuals when tested with the Procrustal ANOVA. According to the ZOO 2016, the smaller the p-value, the higher the significant difference. That's the main reason why the value of p-value to be considered in this study is p less than 0.001 just because p less than 0.001 is statistically highly significant. So the conclusion are, this preliminary study can signify the potential of using Harriton numerous character combined with the geometric morphometry in order to determine the ethnicity of individuals. Besides, this result can be acknowledged so that this technique can be applied by the forensic document examiner in order to analyze and determine the ethnic origin of writer when they do the forensic investigation on the common fraud. Probably in future, more study will focus on the greater numbers of individuals. Also can do the different Malaysia ethnic combination, for example, Malay, Chinese and Indian, as this study only focus on Malay and Chinese individuals. These are the reference for the study. That's all from me. Thank you. Okay, so thank you so much, Ms. Wan Shafawani. Uh, let's proceed with your Q&A session. And for that, uh, you may now turn on your microphone and camera. And I will pass it to the judges. So five minutes, yeah. 
ओके हेलो ओ या वन यू आर द यू आर सेमा ये रोते तो नंबर पुन आह आई बिकॉज़ आई एम नॉट डूइंग लैब सो आई स्टे इन माय बेडरूम एंड लाइक आई हैव ओनली वन क्वेश्चंस ओके बिकॉज़ वी नो दैट बे द प्रिंसिपल ऑफ द हैंड राइटिंग एक्चुअली इज नो टू पर्सन्स राइट द सेम एंड द Uh, the, the, the only individual is not going to write the same twice. Yeah. So how are going to consider the inter variations within the same individual on the handwriting? Doctor, case? sorry, uh, I can hear the question clearly. Can you repeat? Oh, okay. So we know that the principle of handwriting examination is that there's there's no two person write the same. Yeah. Okay. And there's also. Uh, one in an individual is not going to write the same exactly the same twice. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is the principle, right? So mm -hmm. in this case, when you do the calculate, do the exam, uh, do the analysis, how are going to how are going to consider about the intra variations within the same individuals? Ah, uh, within individual, okay, doctor. So the in this study, the basic idea of the study is to explore. And discriminate the these two ethnic only based on their general appearance, shape, and stroke pattern of numeral handwriting of numeral digit handwriting by using the geometric geometry. In this case, we do not consider the intra and inter variation between individuals. We focus on the class characteristic between ethnicity because we How want to the same. In, uh, my question is the same individual. The same individual. So basically, doctor, uh, mostly even though in Chinese, even though the handwriting actually from the people with the same ethnicity could write the character uh, uh, similar in courtesy, they appear appear like similar in courtesy. It's not that hundred percent similar, doctor. Yes, it appear like for Chinese person, for the Chinese person, they write. Uh, preferably, they write in the compass and more straight through. Between the Malay for the Malay, they write more slightly curvy. So because in this study is not is only the preliminary study, so we only focus the class characteristic. We not focus the between individual characteristic between ethnic itself. Okay, so this is something we can consider in translation. Okay, pass the yeah. pass the question to Lee. This is your expert. <laughs> your expertise. <laughs> <Not really. laughs> your expertise. Yeah, I just, I just wondering, in your exclusion and uh, inclusion criteria you mentioned just now, you did not consider the education background uh, of the <clears throat> of your subject, uh, because nowadays we know a lot of Malays also prefer to add, uh, to study in the Chinese primary school, uh, which could affect their background. Uh. So, did you consider the education background of your subject? Uh, actually, uh, in this study, I also consider their uh, primary school for Malay must be attend uh, the sekolah kebangsaan for the Chinese must be attend the sekolah jenis kebangsaan China and it was my mistake to not mention in my slide. Okay, then uh, uh, in your methodology, you did mention uh, one of the steps is you do the pre-processing uh, before you oh, yeah. proceed to the principal component analysis and you mm -hmm. highlight because the pre-processing need to be performed to eliminate the noise. Would you mind to give me one example of noise of noise that could happen in your data that you need to perform the pre-processing? Oh, the data is not the noise. That could be appear in the digital image is probably it come from the paper, as uh, the scanner scanning in high uh, DPI. So probably they can scan the uh, probably the fiber of paper. So I need to smoothing and remove the noise that could be appear nearest to the Hamilton's number. Okay, then uh, I I would like to know. What's the difference between the Procrustes and Nova? This is different from the conventional one, is it? Yeah, true. Can you share with me the difference between this Procrustes and Nova with the conventional one? <laughs> okay, the, the Procrustes and Nova is actually is come uh, in the dah memang ada dalam morphology. So principal component and Procrustes and Nova 
can be just run by using the morphology. We don't need uh, and use another uh, the conventional ANOVA by using the SPSS. Just run the focus ANOVA in the tab of morphology and then it come up with the result with the significant value. Either at the significant value. I could show the. the so the, I would like to know the theoretical difference. What made you that you have to use the procrastors? It's not because it's come with the software. Yeah. It's all you have. What is, no a, what is the principle? <laughs> the, what is the principle that difference behind? Or why you can't uh -huh. use the conventional one? <laughs> because uh, okay, the, um, because the data set itself uh, I uh, inserted into the MoFoJ, and then I cannot print out the data set to enter into the uh, to insert it into the SPSS. Because the data itself income is the TPF file. And then I need to insert it into the Mo4j. And then in Mo4j itself, uh, they are building. Then yang semua tu, I nak cerita perkutuan ada apa punya principle. I cannot so sure. I takut I bagi information yang tak. Uh, right. Sorry, I cannot answer with that question. Okay, thank you, thank you. Okay, <laughs> okay thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, judges. Thank you, participants. Shall move on to our third participant. Uh, it will be code F07, Ms. Sarah Aliyah, Binti Amir Sarifuddin, with her research entitled Visualization of Methamphetamine Salt Contaminated Finger Marks Using Peel Emission Scanning Electron Microscope. Your video will be played now. Assalamualaikum and good afternoon. My name is Sarah Aliyah and I am from Forensic Science Program, School of Health Sciences, Exercise Nation. My presentation for today is on the visualization of mass emitting salt contaminated finger marks using field emission scanning electron microscope. In 2018, Royal Mission Police seized a drug lab and 1.27 million ringgit of drugs. In 2020, illegal drug labs were raided. A person was caught. This year, another two drug labs were seized. More individuals were arrested. These were some of the many cases investigated by our law enforcement agencies. As you can see in the previous slide, the availability of illicit drugs is a serious security threat and they are mainly produced and fed in clandestine laboratories. When there are drugs and labs, there will be people. And the primary identification for these individuals is from finger marks identification. Because of this, the key question to be answered by forensic investigators especially is whether a finger mark was left on the surface before or after the initiation of clandestine activities. In a clandestine lab situation, finger marks can be deposited in various ways. Individuals could handle a substance and subsequently depositing their contaminated finger marks on the surface. Finger mark can firstly be deposited on the surface and subsequently contaminated with any substances or perhaps the other way around. Since the production of these illicit substances can happen practically anywhere, detection of both finger marks and illicit substances are vital for forensic investigation. Hence, the aim of this study was to investigate the visualization of finger marks on illicit methamphetamine contaminated surface and to estimate the instance of their respective deposition. This study was conducted by deposited groomed sebaceous erythrin finger marks on glass cover slips. Sebaceous erythrin finger marks were groomed by wiping the thumb on the forehead and nose. Next, methamphetamine hydrochloride was obtained from the chemistry department nature and was dissolved in methanol to obtain 1 mg per mil of concentration. The methamphetamine salt was dissolved in methanol to ensure even application of the drug onto the surface by spraying method. The samples were then coated with gold coating and visualized under FESCM. The total number of samples visualized in this study was 10. And the 10 samples were 10 finger mark only, 
illicit methamphetamine drugs only, latent finger mark dusted with white fingerprint powder, latent finger mark dusted with black fingerprint powder, pre-contaminated latent finger marks, pre-contaminated latent finger mark dusted with white and black fingerprint powder, and post-contaminated latent finger marks, post-contaminated latent finger mark dusted with white powder, and finally post-contaminated latent finger mark dusted with black fingerprint powder. Pre-contaminated finger marks were finger marks that were deposited on a clean surface then followed by the deposition of methamphetamine salt by spraying. For post-contamination, the finger marks were deposited on the surface that had been priorly contaminated with the methamphetamine salt. Each sample was visualized at 50 times, 250 times, 500 times, and 2000 times magnification. As you can see, at the 50 times magnification, the minus shade, in this case, a bifurcation of the latent finger mark could be seen clearly. And the areas of ridges and non ridges could also be differentiated, and this was also applicable for those in higher magnification as well. the mass and vitamin salt, the crystalline structures, which you can see in square-like sheets, could be seen starting at 250 times magnification, and the clearest image of the salt is as on the image of 2000 times magnification. When the little finger marks were dusted with fingerprint powder on this slide, the upper left was with white powder and the upper right was with black powder. The areas of ridges and non ridges could still be differentiated, although not as prominent as the samples without powdering due to the clumping of the powder as you can see on the images with 2000 times magnification. The images at the bottom are the non powdered contaminated latent finger marks. The left one is pre contaminated which, as mentioned before, the finger mark was deposited on a clean cover slip followed by the deposition of the mass and the result. While for the post-contaminated finger mark, the surface was sprayed with mass and the result first followed by the deposition of the finger mark. When you compare the pre and post images at 50 times magnification, you can actually differentiate the finger marks from one another. For the post-contamination, the finger marks had push the mass and the salt, causing the accumulation of the salt at the outer region of the rich area. While no such thing had occurred during pre-contamination. And the crystal structure of the mass and the salt could also be seen at 2000 times magnification as you can see in the circle. Much differences once the contaminated finger marks were dusted with fingerprint powder, either with white or black powder. The ridges and non ridges area could still be differentiated, and the crystal structures of the mass afternoon salt could be visualized at 2000 times magnification. And as you can see on the slide, the crystal were marked in the circles as well. As a conclusion, based on this study, it was found that crystal structures of the mass amitamine salt could be observed from 250 times magnification onwards under the scanning electron microscope. Presence of finger marks contaminated with mass amitamine could demonstrate the potential to discriminate pre- and post-contaminated finger marks. And that is all from me. These are my references. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Sarah Anja. All right, so let's proceed with your Q&A session. You can now turn on your microphone and also your camera. Over to the judges for a total of five minutes. Thank you. Yes, Lee, do you want to start first? 
Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. I just got one question. Huh? Uh, what is the significance or importance uh, that you need to, uh, to, to differentiate the pre-contaminated and post-contaminated finger mark? Um, first of all, um, the difference is uh, one of, uh, in, how to say, in, uh, let's say I give you one scenario. Uh, for pre-contaminated finger marks, if um, the finger marks was found below the finger, uh, the methamphetamine, uh, the individual might say that um, that uh, he or she deposited the fingerprint uh, way before whatever clandestine activity occurred. So, um, but then for post-contamination, uh, there's higher chance, uh, chances of that individual to be at that uh, site uh, during or after the uh, initiation, initiation of the clandestine lab. Meaning, um, let's say the drug is ready on top of the surface and then you somehow put your finger mark on it, uh, the higher, it's much more higher chances of that individual to be somehow involved in the activity, one of the, one of the scenarios. Thank you. Okay, Sarah. This is our project, so what should I ask? Huh? Okay, okay, so in your case, you are using pure amphetamines, okay? Pure amphetamines to, to do the testing. So, but we not all know that um, the drugs always adulterate with something else, okay? If, mm -hmm. okay, if your drug is being adulterated with something else like glucose or mannitol or anything else, will it affect your result? Um, what, 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 what kind of result you will get? If that is the case, uh, in the study we uh, didn't try. We didn't try um to uh, uh to somehow stimulate that kind of scenario. But um, one of the assumption that I can give is that um the differences between pre and post contaminated uh, post contaminated finger marks is that pre contaminated finger marks tend to be more smudged than the um, post-contaminated uh, post-contamination that is one thing so um the, there's the chances of if let's say the drugs being adulterated with other substances it might give um almost the same uh result perhaps that is one thing in terms of the physical appearance you say the much yeah. how about the crystal uh the crystal one of the thing one about the crystal is that um in this study, we can detect the crystal around 2,000 magnifications. So I assume that if there are other uh, substances, we might be able to detect the substances as well. Are we running out of time, MCs? Yeah, one more minute. <laughs> okay, one more minute. Okay, so so in this case, so you back to the scenario, if you have the fingerprint and also the drug contamination, uh, the drugs contaminated contaminations, so what what how are you going to propose to the um, forensic investigator? Uh, based on this study, um, the uh, I would suggest that you uh, somehow find uh, secure and somehow preserve the evidence for uh, finger mark first. Uh, because even if you preserve the finger mark, let's say you dust the finger mark for um, detection, it won't. Um, Effect the identification of methamphetamine. But if you straight away, let's say, um, try to find the drugs without uh, preserving the finger mark, the finger mark might be destroyed. So um, it would be uh, suggested that to preserve the finger mark evidence first uh, so that the mass so can be preserved as well. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, thank you, judges. Thank you, Miss Sarah Halia. You may now turn off your microphone and camera. Thank you. Um, we will now proceed to our next presenter, presenter code F08, Dr. Venkata Kanti Vaishnavi Redham, with her research entitled Bite Mark Analysis Novel to for Ethnicity Identification in Malaysian Population Using Manual and Digital Method, a Retrospective Study. Your video will be played now. Good morning to here. I, participant F08, would like to present my research on bite mark analysis, a novel tool for ethnicity identification in Malaysian population 
using manual and digital method a retrospective study. Forensic odontology is a field of forensic science which utilizes the expertise of a dentist to analyze dental records for the purpose of investigating criminal cases, calamities or sexual abuse. Bite mark analysis is one such field in forensic odontology or forensic science which is used to identify individuals based on the uniqueness of their dental characteristics. This bite mark pattern can be analyzed either by manual method or digital methods. Since long manual methods have been used, however, poor quality of the bite marks and inaccuracy or lack of proper dental records has led to its inaccuracy in the recent era. That is why digitization of dental records have emerged and image analysis software has been much faster used in identifying the bite marks by forensic dentists. So digitization in forensic odontology has been new and gradually emerging. And I would probably say that this is the first of its kind of study in Malaysia in order to correlate the bite marks with the ethnicity in the Malaysian population using manual and image analysis digital method. We have also tried to compare the accuracy of bite mark analysis using manual method with digital method. In this study, the dental records and dental casts of the patients who had visited the Ames Dental Center has been taken from 2016 until date. 90 subjects in the age group of 20 to 40 years, irrespective of the gender predilection, has been selected. 30 Malay, 30 Chinese and 30 Indian races in Malaysian population have been selected. Then bite registration has been made using the modeling wax using the patient dental cast. So you can see that this is the patient dental cast which has been turned into the modeling uh, wax uh, templates. Then institutional ethical clearance has been always approved before the conduct of the study. And the main inclusion criteria is presence of complete set of permanent dentition until the maxillary and mandibular first molars has been selected, whereas all other traumatic conditions or pathological conditions or missing teeth has been excluded from our study. Firstly, the bite registration wax templates has been utilized by two independent observers in the manual method and using a scale divided and a vernier caliper, the recordings have been recorded on this performa sheet. The investigators were blinded for information that reveals identifying information of patients of interest. The second, that is a digital method using image software version 1.8 has been used in order to measure and count the data in a more objective and reproducible manner with enhanced quality. So this uh, software has been utilized in our study in order to measure the various measurements. So prior to the start, this software has been standardized to avoid any further so this photos of the bite registration has been opened through the image analysis software and the region of interest is selected using the measurement tool. And the values have been obtained, have been placed in the Microsoft Excel for statistical analysis. The same performa sheet has been used even for digital method, wherein we have seen the intercanine distance, intermolar distance, basal arch width and individual tooth measurements of the maxillary that is the upper arch and lower arch has been made. Statistical analysis of one-way ANOVA and interclass correlation has been performed on all the data which has been stored in the Excel spreadsheet using the SPSS software. Moving on to the results, we have table 1, table 2, table 3, table 4 which shows the bite mark analysis with the ethnicity of maxillary and mandibular cast using the two methods that is a manual method and digital method individually. Whereas the result file shows the comparison of digital method over the manual method in the bite mark analysis. So this is the table one which shows the comparison of bite mark analysis amongst the three groups of the Malaysian population on the maxillary cast using the manual method. And the same has been done using the digital method, which also has been statistically significant. Then third table shows the bite mark analysis amongst the three groups of the population on the mandibular cast using the manual method. 
and differences in the bike mark analysis on the mandibular cast using the digital method has been done. So if we see all the ta four tables have different teeth which are statistically significant and some of them have overlapping parameters which is also statistically significant and there is differences either between the Indian or Chinese, Indian or Malay and Chinese and Malay population. And result 5 is where intra-class correlation has been done to measure the agreement between the manual and digital measurements. So this correlation coefficient between the two methods has been done. However, it has shown a poor agreement. So to move on to the discussion, there has been a study by Rajshek Retal in 2012 where bite marks has been one of the tools of identification in forensic odontology. However, because of large number of errors, this manual method is less reliable. While Kapil Verma has seen that there is analysis of the shape of bite marks which has been very useful in the court of law. Then Kaur et al. in 2013 stated that human bite mark is capable of withstanding extremes of temperatures and environmental condition and hence this information is very reliable from the diseased era. Then when we look at the table 1, we have seen that these are all the parameters which has been statistically significant. And table 3 also shows the statistically significant differences between the three groups of the population using the manual method. And as I told you, this is the first of its kind to measure these parameters between three groups of the Malay population. However, Wong Lai Hong et al. is only a study which has been conducted in 2015 wherein there has been differences in the teeth structure between Malaysian and Chinese ethnicities only. And it was found to be very significant in the mesodistal diameter of mandibular left canine between both these. Then when we look at the digital studies, Anarbin Maji et al. in 2018 analyzed and compared the bite marks of males and females using the computer-assisted method. And Lalita et al. had also identified and analyzed the bite marks using the computer-based superimposition technique that is Adobe Photoshop. And Shimpai Mastuda et al. had stated that there is no digital technology which is universally accepted to be uh, effective in forensic odontology because of its cost and availability. So therefore, on the whole lack of digital records or software, dentists still may have to use manual methods to trace the bite marks from the discussion. And however, when we look at table 2 and table 4, we have found that various uh, parameters have been statistically significant among the different races of the Malaysian population using the digital method. Intra-class correlation which has been done shows a poor agreement. So from all this we can say that although individual findings are significant, however since it's the first study to compare the methods with limited population size, results can be better validated with larger sample size and also based on the circumstance and obtainability of digital software, either we can proceed with manual method or digital method at the crime scene as it gives a poor agreement between them. To conclude, bite mark analysis is one of the noble tools which has gained utmost importance in the field of forensic odontology and is a source of expertise and expert witness in the court of law. To our knowledge, this is the first of its kind to correlate the bite mark analysis and measurements in various races of the Malaysian population and we also saw that there is statistically significant differences in the bite mark analysis between Indian, Chinese and Malay race of the Malaysian population. So we hope this study will enlighten all investigators and provide a source for narrowing the process of identification of individuals based on ethnicity in criminal cases and child abuse. So these are our references. I think my greatest ambition in life is to pass on to others what I know. So with this quote, I would like to uh, thank all the organizers of this uh, symposium to have given me this opportunity for presenting my research in this uh, oral presentation. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Venkata. Let's uh, proceed to your Q&A session. Dr. Venkata, you may now turn on your microphone and camera. And over to the judges, five minutes from now. Good evening, judges. Yeah, hi. Maybe hi. maybe I start first. Huh? <laughs> 
uh, just now Thank you me. mentioned you need to standardize your software. Yes, I'm wondering what does it mean by standardize the software? Um, ma'am, actually, the this software uh, priorly whatever study we conduct, we need to set in the measurements before we uh, go into the conduct of the study. Let it be not only the forensic part. Any study that we conduct, we have measurement table wherein we have to set the pixels of the uh, picture along with the measurements so as to have the standardization throughout the study. I think what you did is not standardized software. Maybe <laughs> it's some sort of the parameter of the methods or whatever. I don't think you should use the term standardized software. Okay, ma'am. Maybe the term uh, that yeah. I have used may not be much <laughs> yeah. of it. But what yeah. I meant is we need to set in the exact yeah. pixelated scales with the measure. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Okay. Because we take the picture of the template and then we uh, decide on the uh, measurements. Yeah, you need to define so the data. Yes. Yes, uh, yes. Yes. Just now you mentioned you uh, you have performed the one way and no one. Do you yes, mind to give me the now and alternative hypothesis that you apply uh, to perform that test? Okay. Uh, the null hypothesis is there is uh, 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 th there is no uh, there is significant uh, uh, difference between the Indian Chinese and uh, Malay uh, races of the Malaysian population. Alternate is there is no significant differences between the measurements taken in with different races of the population. I, I think you need to double check the now and alternative hypothesis. <laughs> and, uh, you did not present any result on the post hoc test, uh, even though you found out the one way and all present a uh, significant value. Uh, or did you? Uh, no, ma'am, I have not put in any of the tables uh, based on that because not much of significance was it. Whatever values had been significant, only that I had um, uh, given it to the audience. So, so you will not perform because, any uh, uh, test? No, no, no. <coughs> Why? Uh, ma'am, uh, this is the first study we have just tried upon. Maybe on a next study, we will go in depth of all the analysis. Okay, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Okay, okay. So Lee already asked about the comparison between the races. So I asked about the comparison between the two methods. So because in your introduction you mentioned that actually manual, the the manual um the manual way is actually providing poor quality, and at the end you are saying that you make a conclusion there is a poor agreement between the manual and also digital methods. So by right, oh, yes. which one is which one is a better one? Uh, sir, actually, uh, manual has been used since uh, uh, just a moment. Manual has been used since many uh, years, actually, and uh, it has been a good method, but uh, poor in the sense because there can be subjective differences over a period of time between individuals. Intra variations can be in the same subject, or when we ourselves as forensic dentists go and. Uh, do it after a few years when we go and try to analyze a bite mark, there can be some differences or so subjective differences can be there. In that way, manually, uh, there can be uh, errors that can occur. So to avoid this, probably we have come into the digital technology. But uh, this digital software uh, being the first time that it has been used, uh, maybe did not give that much uh, good significance in comparison to the manual, although we expected that it could give a good result of it. But uh, since uh, the, um, to, to conclude, I had told that manual and digital can be used is since we did not get the positivity with the digital, we cannot rule out the basic gold standard, which is the manual method that we have been following since many years. So uh, in future, if we are able to try um, these softwares in uh, uh, which is feasible to even the population to buy and use it, then probably if it's validated, then we can start using digitally. Uh, in all types of crime scenes. Okay, that's all for me. Thank you very much. Okay, thank, you, thank, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Okay. Now we'll go to the next presenter. Presenter code F09, Ms. Ainul Haya in the Madatri, with her research entitled Forensic Discrimination of Oxidized pseudo using Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy in tandem with chemometric analysis. Your video will be played now. 
Assalamualaikum and good day everyone. I am Ainul Hayah binti Ahmad Nazri. Welcome to my presentation on forensic discrimination of oxidized pseudoephedrine using Fourier transform infrared spectroscopy in tandem with chemometry analysis. Pseudoephedrine is a phenyl ethyl amine and a diastereomer of ephedrine with sympathomimetic property. The salt of pseudoephedrine normally in hydrochloride and sulfate form were a common active ingredients found in numerous coal medication. It is commonly sold with one or more additional active ingredients such as acetaminophen, antihistamine, glafenacin, dextromethorphan and or ibuprofen. The medical uses of pseudoephedrine include as a stimulant, a nasal and sinus decongestant, and a wakefulness promoting agent. However, by taking this medication in overdose and for long term period, it may stimulate the, the central nervous system, which can cause insomnia, nervousness, excitability, dizziness, and anxiety, hypertension, hallucination, seizure, paranoid psychosis, and stroke. Pseudoephedrine is highly abused because of its stimulant effect as it can create a euphoria, overactive feeling and increased heart rate and blood pressure. It has been reportedly abused in clandestine operation as precursor for production of synthetic drugs, particularly amphetamine type stimulant and new psychoactive substance. The reduction and oxidation reaction of pseudoephedrine as in figure 1.2 will afford methamphetamine and methcatenone respectively. Figure 1.3 shows the isolation process of pseudoephedrine from the cold medication tablet. The most, the most common method that are used to extract out the pseudoephedrine from the tablet are acid-based and direct extraction technique and the chosen method will be depend on the type of active and inactive ingredients that are also present in the tablet. Prevention of pseudoephedrine abuse is taken by imposing laws and regulations at the national and international level. For example, pseudoephedrine has been listed as Table 1 precursor under the 1988 United Nations Convention Against Illicit Traffic in Narcotic Drugs and Psychotropic Substance in November 1990, which enforces strict regulation on import, export, customer purchase restriction and behind-the-counter safekeeping. And in our country, Pseudoephedrine has been regulated under the Poison Act 1952. This research work have two objectives. The first one is to characterize the oxidized pseudoephedrine obtained from different oxidizing agents and source of pseudoephedrine precursor by following forensic drug protocol which are preliminary color tests and FTIR analysis. The second objective is to investigate the feasibility of combining non-disruptive ATR-FTIR coupled to chemometrics to distinguish between different batches and their association to the source of origin. Significant of the study, information about precursors and chemicals of illicit manufacture is significant to forensic investigation as it may help drug law enforcement authorities to trace the sources of precursors and chemicals or obtain other information of strategic relevance. Investigation of the origin of the precursors and chemicals used in the manufacturing process can also prevent the reversion of this substance. For methodology, oxidized pseudoephedrine were prepared from the oxidation reaction with two different oxidizers which were potassium dichromate and potassium permanganate using three different sources of pseudoephedrine precursor namely labrid precursor, extracted precursor from brand A and extracted precursor from brand B. Preliminary color tests which were Chins and Lieberman color test reagent were used as the initial screening to identify the identity of the samples and further confirmational tests by FTIR was done to ascertain the identity of the sample. The raw data from the FTIR analysis within the fingerprint region were then subject to PCA analysis. For ethical reason, the brief method for both reactions will not be discussed in detail here. Result and discussion. Result of change color test in figure 1.4 
shows that all the oxidized pseudoephedrine, regardless of their sources, via potassium dichromate reaction, produce orange color product when react with change reagent. However, for samples from potassium permanganate reaction, only samples from black red precursor produce orange color product. The formation of orange color product is the positive indication of the presence of catenone analogs in the sample. Meanwhile, for Lieberman's color test, all the samples from potassium dichromate reaction when read with Lieberman's reagent give rise to intensively yellow color product and only samples from lab grade precursor produce yellow color product with Lieberman's reagent. Interestingly, this result is consistent with the result from King's color test. Results from FTIR have shown that all the samples from potassium dichromate reaction and the samples that use lab grade precursor via potassium permanganate reaction have produced FTIR spectra consistent with the spectra of methcatenone. The prominent band for methcatenone at 1688 corresponds to the carbonyl groups reaction and other characteristic band for methcatenone such as at 245515 and 6. 9.8 were observed in both of the spectra. Figure 1.11 and 1.12 shows the spectral pattern of the repetitive batches of sample from lab grade precursor for both methods. Note that the spectra of all the samples of each method were very similar to each other, and this shows that each of the methods used have a good repeatability and reproducibility. Similar results were also observed for all batches of sample for potassium dichromate reaction that use extracted precursor from brand A and brand B, in which the resultant spectra was a typical spectra for methcatenone and the spectra is consistent between batch to batch. However, for all samples that use extracted precursor from brand A and brand B via potassium permanganate reaction, Produce the spectra resemble the spectra of pseudoephedrine precursor as included in figure 1.15 and 1.16. This result shows that the oxidation of pseudoephedrine into the product using potassium permanganate was not fully achievable using the extracted precursor from cold medication tablet. For principal component analysis, figure 1.17 illustrated the score plot for PC analysis of samples synthesized by potassium dichromate. The first and second component, PC1 and PC2, that is used to construct the score plot explain 60.5% and 15.2% of variance respectively. Together, these two PC describe 75.7% .7 of total variance in the data set. There are 10 clusters of varying compression were readily evident. Each cluster comprised of samples from the same batches. And clusters originated from different types of pseudoephedrine precursors can be clear, clearly discriminated between one another. For instance, clusters in red circle are from the lab grade pseudoephedrine, clusters in green circle are from brand A, and clusters in blue circle are from brand B. Meanwhile, for samples that is synthesized via potassium permanganate synthetic root, the combination of the two PC explain about 77.9% of the total variation in the data set. There are also 10 clusters that comprise of the samples from the same batches were, were, were readily evident. The cluster in red circle were clearly discriminate from the cluster in blue and green circle. However, there are batches of sample from brand B uh, in blue circle were grouped together within the cluster of brand A in green circle. As the conclusion, both potassium dichromate and potassium permanganate reaction produce oxidized product consistent with methcatenone hydrochloride when the precursor of higher purity is used as the starting materials. Oxidized product from brand A and brand B via potassium dichromate reaction are also produced the spectra typical for methcatenone hydrochloride. However, for potassium permanganate reaction, both types of precursor produce spectra resemble the spectra of pseudoephedrine which indicate the incomplete 
conversion of precursor to oxidized product. So chromatography analysis is currently being performed to further identify the oxidized product. PCA is able to discriminate sample with considerably good classification degree, which is over 76% discrimination level. And further pretreatment of FTIR data set would potentially improve classification of oxidized product from various sources of pseudo effedrine precursor. These are the references. That's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Ms. Anul Hayah. Let's proceed with your Q&A session now. Uh, we are inviting Dr. Wan Perch Kaila Pandesa as a representative of Ms. Anul Hayah. Dr. Wan Nosh Haila, you will now turn on the microphone and camera. Over to the judges. Starting now for five minutes of QA. <coughs> Okay, Assalamualaikum and good afternoon, everyone. Um, but actually, um, I'm I'm not really uh, represent. Uh, I know I'm just here to stand by. If there is any um, questions that you would like to know about this work, uh, seeing that we're part of the uh, same <coughs> research group, lah. Uh, if you have a uh, a questions that um, I can help you with, uh, I'd be happy to answer, lah. But I'm not be judged, yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, if you think uh, it's appropriate for me to answer, then you can uh, just for the sake of uh, sure, 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 no problem. Uh, mm, okay, I'm just curious because I look into your PCA plot. Um, you men uh the the study mentioned that there will be ten cluster comprising of each pages, but based on how that how how do you make the the clustering bit um come to the conclusion with ten different cluster in the PCA plot? Uh, well, if you refer to the slides, uh, the methodology slides, uh, it's actually the drug, uh, the oxidized product was from 10 different batches. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, with that prior knowledge, you have to um, remember that with PCA, PCA and HCA is the um, unsupervised model uh, whereby the classification or the discrimination is up to the uh, researcher to interpret based on previous knowledge. So we know, mm -hmm. we tested, we know that we have 10 samples and from there we can see uh, clear 10 groupings. So that's why uh, you can see that uh, the, there is 10 circles, she made 10 circles because of the previous knowledge that she had and she did the discrimination according to the previous knowledge that uh, she had. Yeah, it's just that the the but the three member within the same cluster is somehow like quite a distance from each other. And if we look into the uh, PCA plot, actually, the 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 different member from different clusters somehow is more closer than 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 the one the same the the member from the same cluster. That's why I'm That's not why sure. Uh -huh. I'm not sure how how does the clustering being formed and make up to a. Uh, 70% a uh, 76% discriminative level like this is this is 76% discrimination uh, level is uh, is automated eh? uh, and it's actually being calculated from the pc uh, scores okay uh, the the uh, taburan eh, the uh, distribution distribution of the samples is from PC1 score and PC2 scores. Mm -hmm. So summing up the two, uh, because we know when we put uh, the data into uh, principal component analysis, it will generate um, a new set of data. Okay. And then from the uh, variables, uh, it picks out which are the variables that characterize the samples. So from those new values, Okay, it's being added up together and it given that uh, the discrimination is above 70%. Okay, and then uh, the discrimination is based on prior knowledge. Okay, uh, um, so yeah, it is kind of subjective. Okay, uh, I have to agree with that. It's kind of subjective and um, the groupings is made based on what 
the uh, researcher understands about their um, sample. Okay. It is subjective. Yeah. yeah. Because that, that's why it is called as unsupervised yeah. uh, discrimination Wait, model. Yeah. Uh, just now, uh, you did mention that given for the pseudo, uh, pseudo, uh, sorry, the name, <laughs> pseudo. Pseudo <laughs> epidrine. Yeah, you got a few uh, yeah, chemicals yeah, uh, that you, ap you apply to oxidize it. Uh. So I just yeah. wondering what is the, the important, uh, does it important to differentiate the chemical that oxidize to produce that pseudo? <laughs> Uh, it actually, we use the same chemicals, pseudo -ephedrine. It's just that the manner on uh, how the pseudo -ephedrine was obtained, because we know that for different uh, manufacturer, maybe they uh, they has different grades. So this is um, very very useful for uh, forensic drug profiling, because we know that nowadays people synthesize drug means that it's a made up drug. So if we can uh, have like three different sources, even though it's it's like nasi lemak lah, okay? You eat, you get nasi lemak from Penang, it's different. You get nasi lemak from Kelantan, it's kind of different. So uh, being able to profile this and then uh, assign it to different sources, I think it's a, a um, it's a way forward lah for to help the enforcers to tackle uh, synthesis of drugs. From the root. Okay. Is the answer your question? Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. I okay. All right. I appreciate the questions. Off. Thank That's you very good. much. And uh, I know say sorry lah for her and be, being unable to uh, attend this Q and A because she has some um, health reasons lah. Okay, thank you very no much. Problem, thank you. Thank you too, Doctor Wan. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay. Bye. Okay, now we shall go to our final presenter for today. Presenter code F01, Mr. Morgan Raj Devarajan, to present his research titled A Content Analysis on Transnational Wildlife Crime in Malaysia between 2016 and 2020. Your video will be played now. Very good morning, I bid to everyone. My name is Morgan Raj Devarajan. I am a final year forensic science student from University Science Malaysia. I've recently conducted a, a final year project titled Content Analysis on Transnational Wildlife Crime in Malaysia between 2016 and 2020. Transnational wildlife crime has become a serious issue faced by Malaysia due to its negative implications for the conservation of protected wildlife, public health and safety. Whenever an environmentalist and wildlife conservationist and even the wildlife enforcement officer want to express their opinions and issues regarding wildlife crime, they would go to a free sourced and easily accessible media that has the capability of rendering the intended message to a huge group of people. It is none other than the online news media. Online news media has played its part in publishing articles on wildlife crimes occurring in Malaysia. Therefore, this study aims to conduct a thematic content analysis of online news articles to better understand the reality of transnational wildlife crime. There are three study backgrounds. First is the breadth of transnational wildlife crime. Second is the dire consequences of transnational wildlife crime. And third is the role of law enforcement authorities. The general objective of this study is to better understand the reality of transnational wildlife crime through content analysis of online news reports. There are five specific objectives. First, to evaluate the association between various thematic contents. Second, to comprehend the mechanisms involving transnational wildlife crime. Third, to understand the challenges faced by the wildlife officers with regards to wildlife crime. Fourth, to cognize transnational wildlife crime countermeasures and fifth, to discover the attitude of wildlife officers towards wildlife crimes. The first specific objective was addressed through quantitative analysis. The rest specific objectives were addressed through qualitative content analysis. There are five research questions that resonate the five specific objectives. There are three problem statements and three study rationales in this uh, research. The first problem statement is that Malaysia is a source and transit hub for illegal wildlife trade, 
speaking for the seriousness of this issue. Second is that there is a disharmony of laws between regions in Malaysia. Third is that the challenges posed by the enforcement mechanisms. The first study rationale as to why this study should be conducted is that the dearth of research concerning content analysis in this study matter, which is the transnational wildlife crime. Second is that the subtle green terminology needs more attention. And the third rationale is that this study will provide insights about problems faced by Malaysian law enforcement and wildlife agencies. There are three study significances. First is the factual transparency where more information and attributes contributing to the transnational wildlife crime can be identified through content analysis. And second uh, study significance is to improve wildlife crime prevention strategies through the information attained from the uh, online news reports. Third is to enhance enforcement mechanisms. These are the 10 hypotheses that has been uh, de developed based on the literature review. These hypotheses contest the association between the mentions of various thematic contents and the type of online news portals. These thematic contents include uh, wildlife crime mechanism, legislation, enforcement mechanisms, and so forth. Demands for wildlife products were identified based on the literature review. The first demand is the traditional medicine, where some of the wildlife products were perceived to have medicinal properties, such as pangolin scales in traditional Chinese medicine and zero horns in traditional Malay medicine. The second demand is for consumption, such as the pangolin meat consumption as an exotic meat. Second is the gaps in knowledge. Archival analysis in green technology is the first gap, where the attributes of wildlife crimes are rarely studied through archival analysis, in which case, suffice to say, never in Malaysia. Hence, this study will fill in the gap by conducting an archival analysis of transnational wildlife crime, contributing to the field green terminology. The second gap in knowledge is the paucity of qualitative research in the field of study. The content analysis on transnational itself is scarce, let alone a qualitative research. Next is the online news portals. The Star Online and Traffic News were selected for this study. The Star Online has the highest number of readers among the local English online news media, whereas Traffic News solely publishes issues revolving wildlife trade and wildlife crime occurring in Malaysia as well as around the world. A conceptual framework was erected based on the literature review. The elements constituting transnational wildlife crime includes mechanisms, challenges, transnational wildlife crime countermeasures, and the attitude. Moving on to the methodology, the qualitative research design used an evolved grounded theory with inductive approach. The study population was the online news articles from the Star Online and Traffic News, and the sample size was 117 online news articles. The sampling method used was non-probability sampling method utilizing purposive criteria technique. As for the quantitative research design, the research approach used was secondary data analysis. As for the research strategy, cross-tabulation using Pearson chi-squared analysis was employed to determine the significance differences of the associations contested. The fee correlation coefficient analysis was used to determine the strength of these significant differences. Next, the sampling method used was non-probability sampling method utilizing purposive criteria technique. These are the inclusion and exclusion criteria used in this study. The research procedure starts with articles searched in the Star Online and Traffic News websites. The data refined using the inclusion and exclusion criteria mentioned before. They were uploaded in NVivo 12 for qualitative analysis. The themes were coded and relevant information was extracted. Thematic contents were subjected to quantitative analysis as iterated in the hypothesis. SPSS version 26 was used to carry out chi-square tests for independence. Quantitative and qualitative results were reported and the revised operational and conceptual frameworks were developed. This table shows the result for the quantitative analysis based on the p-values obtained then uh, null hypothesis 2 
4 and 7 were rejected where the uh, mentions of legislations, mentions of challenges and mentions of recommendation differed significantly uh, between the online news media. For example, in Anal Hypothesis 4, the mentions of challenges were, uh, were significantly differed between the traffic news and the star online based on the fee where coefficient uh, computed it shows that the star online uh, has uh, higher mentions of challenges compared to traffic news these tables shows the result of the thematic content analysis where various sub themes and emerged nodes were identified from the content analysis these sub themes were integrated into the conceptual framework based on the revised conceptual framework the mechanisms identified were wildlife crime mechanism, legislation and enforcement mechanism. The seven challenges identified were lack of human resources, financial constraints, public involvement, corruption, technological advancement, infrastructural advantage, knowledge about wildlife. The transnational countermeasures were the in-practice countermeasures, the effectiveness of the countermeasures, the recommendations to improve those countermeasures whereas the attitudes identified were attitudes towards transnational wildlife crime and attitudes towards penalties. The conceptual framework was further developed where the both quantitative and qualitative analysis results were combined under one operational framework. This operational framework shows the uh, associations and the relationship between the online news media and the mentions of the various themes and sub-themes as well as the nodes. The values uh, attributed to the various uh, association that has contested through the iterated uh, hypothesis were also integrated in this operational framework. The general objective of this study, which is to better understand the reality of transnational wildlife crime through content analysis of the online news reports was achieved. As for the specific objectives, the association between various thematic contents were evaluated. The mechanisms involved in transnational wildlife crime was comprehended. The challenges faced by wildlife officers with regards to wildlife crime was understood. The transnational wildlife crime countermeasures were cognized. And the attitude of not only the wildlife officers but also the wildlife crime perpetrators and wildlife product consumers towards wildlife crimes was discovered. This study is relevant in a sense that it conceptualizes the complexities of transnational wildlife crime issues, it propagates the integrity of online news reporting, and it contributes to the vast literature of green criminology. Uh, there are four limitations of the study. First is the limited study period. Second is the sample size. Third is that this study cannot be generalized across the other online news portals. Fourth is the report bias where it is possible the authors might have left out crucial information to present negative headlines in the online news reports. There are three recommendations from the researcher. First, to improve sample size. Second, to analyze social media content. Third, is to change the type of study from uh, qualitative content analysis to qualitative study of interviews which will yield a raw and unrefined data unlike the content analysis of the online news reports. Fourth is to employ intercoder reliability. Although this study validated its findings by comparing them with the existing literature and previous findings, the reliability of the data extracted were not ascertained. Future researchers should allow two individuals from the research team to quote 10 samples from each news website and compute the percentage agreement between the two coders. These are the partial references um, used in this study. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, that's all from me. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Morgan Raj. Uh, let's move to the video. You may now turn on your microphone go to the judges for the next five minutes. Hi Morgan, how are you? Devarajan, thank you.
Morgan, can you hear me? Turn on your microphone and camera. Oh, yes, yes. <laughs> oh, you have cut your hair. Okay. okay, how are you? Okay, because most of the question already you you have already answered it during your uh, during your first. Uh, can you hear me? Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, it's okay, it's okay. If 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 is if if it is uh, consuming your bandwidth, you you might you can off your video so that you can save some bandwidth. Uh. Okay, uh, I have only one question because uh, some question you have already answered me in your limitation and future recommendations. So after your research. Okay, after this research, mm -hmm. what are you going to do or what, how are you going to propose to the authority about the finding of your research? Uh, propose the authority. Ah, if, if, if you are now you are going to tell the forestry or anyone, so okay. So what, what kind of strategy or what kind of proposal they are going to propose to those people so that we can prevent this kind of crime or minimize the, this, this kind of crime time? Okay as, as, okay, as you might have seen in my uh, in my conceptual framework and, and also the operational framework, uh, those ideas and those uh, recommendations were given by uh, no lay person. They were uh, conservationists, they were environmentalists. So those kind of things are very important. And, and this study, it, it just concentrated all the ideas under one paper. So, uh, in terms of proposing this to the enforcement, I think we can make uh, you know a list of the recommendations, all the all the uh, challenges and the issues, and uh, you know we might you know like have a meeting with them or like um, have a one-to-one -one discussion with them to discuss all these research findings. Yeah, that's one way to propose it. Yeah. Actually, uh, just another question. Uh, um, based on your sample calculation, how many samples do you need? Because now you have one one seven. Is it one yes. one seven? So, uh, what is the minimum number that you have to achieve so that you can make a more reliable data or result? Actually, one one seven is already a good number of uh, samples for quality qualitative analysis. So, uh, but uh, based on a few studies, uh, they have recommended around 120 to 150 uh, news reports yeah, for a better, uh, uh, better result uh, through qualitative as well as for the quantitative analysis. Okay, I thought you should need more because you said this is one of your limitations. So, so let me pass to you. Yeah. 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 Uh, I would like to ask one question on you. Uh, in your presentation, you mentioned for now hypothesis number four. Is it okay, now hypothesis nice. number four? You mentioned there's a difference between what the star and the transit. Trans international news, is it? Uh, yeah. So I just wondering why you need to determine the differences between that two million. What's the important and what's the kind of interpretation okay. that is relevant to your study? Okay, so the thing is, the Star Online is a Malaysian uh, news media, and Traffic News is an international news media that covers uh, all the uh, wildlife news around the world. So uh, the, 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 the reason for me to determine the differences between the Star Online and Traffic News is to see that um, how far does this uh, uh, news media covers uh, all these um, wildlife crime occurring in Malaysia. Because when there is a, when there is a huge coverage of what is happening here, People will be more, uh, what we can say, people will be more, um, people will know more about these types of crimes. People will be more, uh, they will be cognized about these uh, crimes happening, wildlife crime happening around us. So the reason why I did that uh, difference is that to show that the Star Online is actually doing a great job in covering wildlife crime in Malaysia. I, 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 I discussed that in my thesis. Thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, okay. Doctor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. 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 okay, Doctor. Same to you. Okay, thank you so much, participant. Thank you, judges. Um, with this, 
we have actually come to the end of our oral session. Uh, thank you to all the presenters for your participation and cooperation. A uh, special acknowledgement definitely goes to the panel of judges for evaluating the research presentations. So thank you so much once again, dearest judges. But before we end this session, right, may I request all the participants and judges to actually switch on your camera for a virtual photography session. Once you've switched on, my technical person in charge will actually uh, change your layout to the grid layout. And then we can get a screenshot of all of us as a virtual photography session. For any of you who wants to take picture, if um, your grid doesn't turn out to be in the layout grid, you can actually change manually as well. Hold on for a bit, yeah. We're changing a bit a layout. So what is happening now? Is it done or? Uh, no, not yet. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I guess she has actually uh, changed the layout. So everyone ready? Give me a brighter smile in three, two, one, and say cheese. Okay, I think she got the first screenshot. I was for a second one. <laughs> this will be a uh, freestyle type, so you can do whatever you want. Uh, give her like a few seconds to deal with the first screenshot, yeah? Okay, we're going for the second screenshot. Three, two, one, and freestyle. Say cheese, everyone. Okay, I think um, she's got the screenshot for the second one as well. Mm, thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. But before you leave the virtual room, I'd like to remind all participants to join us on the second day of the e-symposium, which begins at 8.30 a.m. tomorrow. For your information, we have three plenary speech sessions, closing remarks, and prize kicking ceremony. Uh, and also, before that, we kindly request you to fill in the feedback form via the link provided in the chat box. I repeat, please fill in the feedback form via the link provided in the chat box. So we'll, we'll end this session like after about five minutes, I guess, so you can still fill in uh, after this. So thank you so much, and may the best one wins. See you all tomorrow. Bye-bye from me. Bye.